Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast is brought to you by Compassion International. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. That's the website to go to. And you can sponsor a child today and release them from poverty. Your sponsorship providing access to school medical care, food, vocational training, and the opportunity to know Jesus Christ. Compassion International is the most trusted child development ministry in the world. We're so excited to be partnering with them here at Sports Spectrum, a Christ-centered church-based ministry, and simply put, it works. Over 2 million children have been released from poverty in Jesus' name because of Compassion International. So I want to invite you, I want to even challenge you to simply make room around your dinner table to help a child who needs you. Sponsor a child today through Compassion International. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and release a child from poverty today. Today on the podcast, we welcome Liam Hendricks, the Oakland A's pitcher, to the show. Liam was born in Perth, Western Australia. And he's 30 years old, made his Major League Baseball debut September 6, 2011 with the Minnesota Twins. He is the first Australian-born player to ever start an MLB postseason game, which he did back in 2018 for the A's against the Yankees in that wild card game. And this was a fun podcast. I've gotten to meet Liam a couple times in person and his lovely wife, Christy, and they've been at a couple of our Pro Athletes Outreach Conferences and Liam's a great dude, really good guy, just down to earth. And I really have been wanting to get him on for a while on the podcast. So glad we were able to catch up with him. We taped this interview just a couple days before opening day 2019 in the major leagues. We're running this in early April. So the interview itself took place just a couple weeks ago in late March. And just really excited for you to hear his story, his journey. Uh, about a guy who grew up with a dad who was a West Australian Football League player uh, who loved football in Australia probably more than he loved baseball, and he'll tell you about that story. And then he had a really great story about his Major League debut and, and getting the call from the Twins to to start. And we also talked to him about his faith journey as well and what it was like to pitch in Japan. The A's and Mariners actually started the Major League Baseball season a little early, third week of March when they played two games in Japan and those games counted and Liam pitched in both those games unfortunately the A's did not win either of them they were both close games but that whole experience in watching Ichiro with the Seattle Mariners have his final Major League Baseball moment and Liam was in the arena in the in the stadium and in the dugout watching this whole thing unfold so lots of good stuff here let's get to it Liam Hendricks Oakland A's pitcher joins us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Take a listen. Liam, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good to talk to you, Liam. And I know that you just got back from Japan in a very early opener for the A's and the Mariners. Obviously, the results weren't what you were hoping for, but that experience going to Japan, what was that like? That had to be a pretty neat thing to be playing a meaningful game in japan i mean it was really cool uh i'm a big fan of like the japanese culture i i really get into anime and all that sort of stuff so it was really kind of immersing myself in that but i've just been i'm a huge star uh history buff so going over and being a part of a place that's been around just had dynasties which was uh it was really really cool being a part of that for sure so it was um yeah it was exciting being over there obviously i wish we had more time to go sightseeing and uh, since then, me and Christy have actually talked about trying to go over there on vacation at some point just to be able to go around the country a little bit more, see things that we wanted to see and do all that. But uh, being over there for baseball, I mean, obviously we were there for Ichiro's final game. I was actually the last yeah. guy to ever put Ichiro on base. I walked him in uh, in the first game. So I get my little footnote in history somehow. <laughs> hey, you said you're a history buff, so now you're in the history books. <laughs> yeah, Exactly. I'm just trying to be in everybody's footnotes. I mean, I gave up Nelson Cruz's 300th homer, threw me into that one. I mean, but uh, no, it was a really cool experience. Uh, they love their baseball over there, and it's just exciting to be in front of a group of like a crowd like that that's just 
super excited no matter what happens. They were going for both teams until Ichiro came up, and they were only going for Ichiro. But it was just a really cool experience being a part of it. I know you had your, your dad out there, too. I followed you. I saw that you're on Instagram now, and I saw you took a picture with your pops out there. What was it like having your, your – I mean, I'm sure he's been at many of your events and games maybe, but what was that like having him out there in Japan with you? Oh, it was really cool. I mean, he's uh, he's seen me pitch a couple times in the big leagues now. Um but it's still always exciting because it was that was actually part of his 60th birthday present. So we, nice. uh, my mom flew him out. We arranged the hotel and did all that. And then uh, it was it was it was a cool experience. And I'm lucky that uh, like my family gets along pretty well with my wife because she has to deal with them a lot more than I do just because of like I'm at the field. So when I go to the field, she has to take care of them and do that. But he's uh, he's pretty easy going, and he he had a good time. I think so. That was always good. Liam, describe that moment when Ichiro was being honored. It was his final Major League Baseball game, and it was a really cool scene watching it on ESPN uh, in the morning here in the States in Connecticut where I live and watching Ichiro sort of be honored and being you know, allowed to go out in the right field and then having, come, having him come off the field and the crowd going crazy and he's hugging all his teammates. And you're in the – other side of that obviously on the A's dugout but what is that like watching you know an icon in baseball have his moment in his final game it was cool so I'd already pitched in that game so I, I sorry I I was in the bullpen I hadn't pitched yet and so we were uh we all like all the bullpen guys because in Japan the bullpen is right behind the dugout and underneath the underneath the stand so we all ran out ran to the dugout just to be kind of see it and be a part of it because I mean it was insane it you you don't even realize how much that guy has meant to the game of baseball throughout Japan. Like it, it, it really hit me when he embraced uh, Yusei Kikuchi. He's the uh, the new Mariners Japanese player. He uh, well, he actually played in Australia, so I've known of him for a little bit. But he came over, and it was like he broke down. And like once you realize the fact that no, it's not just like overly emotional or anything like that. It's no, this guy is a living legend in Japan. Not only for what he's done on the field, but for what every what he's been able to cultivate through Japanese players in the in the states, and it's, I mean, the guy's, the guy's a legend. I mean, I'm he's one of he's one of the favorite jerseys I've got. I got him to sign a jersey a couple of years ago, and that's that's one of my favorite ones I have. So, it's just uh, watching him do everything he's done. I mean, you you never hear a bad thing about the guy, and that's that's another tribute to him. He's done everything the right way, and that's that's really hard to do in this day and age. Liam, you pitched in both those games in Japan, and you've had some unique experiences recently as a relief pitcher in starting some games. And we'll talk about the the playoff game from last year in a second. But what is that like preparing as a starter? But you're you're a, yet you're a relief pitcher. Does that change the preparation and how you go about pitching based upon whether you're going to start a game versus coming in into the middle of a game, but knowing you're only going to go one or two innings? Uh, not really preparing. The only, the biggest difference for me is warming up. So like, um, at home I can do it the f- same way. Like I'll go out and I'll throw in the bullpen and then I'll pretty much, I, like I'll walk back into the dugout. But from there, it's like, I don't really sit down like I used to do as a starter. Uh, in on the road, it's tough because they don't reset the clock. So if they had to reset the clock, it would have been easy, perfect. I would have just been, I would have run in from the bullpen and done everything that way. But because they don't reset the clock, in New York, it's okay. They've got a back way around. So I finished my warm-up pitches while um, Severino was still on the mound. And then I, I jumped in the bullpen cart, and we drove around the back through into the clubhouse, and I went through it that way. But uh, there's certain places where, like, I did it in Baltimore. didn't realize that they didn't reset the clock. And now I'm running in. I've got three pitches to warm up before the clock runs out for the uh, in-between inning stuff. So the biggest thing for me is just trying to get that – basis of okay i need to warm up take it easy for a couple of minutes and then go back out rather than as a regular reliever you warm up and you run straight into the game and you're good to go what was it like pitching in a postseason game at yankee stadium and there's got to be something about getting ready to go out on the mound as a starter in a postseason game at yankee stadium yeah i mean it's it's definitely exciting um it's luckily i have a little bit of a base of what i can do like, I've pitched in the postseason with the Jays in 2015. So I had some sort of uh, semblance of what I what I was doing because that place is a madhouse in itself because you get all the hockey fans out there. So it was um, – I was semi-used 
to it, but I mean that that place was loud. It was thumping. There was people like everyone was excited to be there, and I don't. There may have been six or seven Oakland hats. I mean, they they just sell out the stadium. It's almost like they have a blackout on on tickets restrictions to any visiting teams. It's insane. <laughs> yeah, they don't take kindly to strangers in Yankee Stadium. That's for no, sure. No, not at all. And like, so we come from Oakland, and Oakland has a, a it's a very transient area. So when we're playing a certain team, like they'll have their group of fans there. And when they like, it's every team that comes in, they have like a significant amount of fans because of people working out here in the Bay area or whatever it is. But I mean, that place is uh, that place is just all pinstriped out. That's awesome. Liam, we always obviously talk faith on this podcast as well. And I know your faith is important to you. We love to hear people's testimonies on the podcast. Share with us for you when, God became a priority in your life and when you started to really understand who Christ was. Tell us about that. So I, uh, I grew up in a, in a Catholic school. Um, so I went to Catholic elementary school, Catholic high school, and it was just that sort of stuff, stuff was ingrained in me from that point on. But when I came over to the States, I was um, like, I kind of fell away from it a little bit because Catholicism is very much, uh, for me, it was, I related it to hell and brimstone and fire and all of that sort of stuff Mm. so it was never like i was it was always more of a okay if you do something bad it's going to be bad not god is loving and god is kind and all of that so uh it wasn't until i met my wife that she was like no you need to like there's uh, there's other things going on we need to get back into the church uh my first pao conference the prophet's outreach conference was actually about about 10 days after we got married Hmm. So we uh, we didn't really go on a honeymoon. We did the PAO thing as a honeymoon, but it, since then it's been it's been a big part of our life. Like we have regular Bible studies of the field. We have uh, like a good group of, of believers on the team, which is really nice. I mean that that's always the biggest basis for me is being able to relate to guys on the team and have that kind of moral background that you can kind of rebound and throw things off and just to make sure that you're like you find. Not never doing anything iffy or anything like that, but just to be able to just sit down and talk and just discuss my faith and what they're going through, what I'm going through, my struggles, their struggles, and just have like that sounding board. Is that important? Just the idea of being transparent. And it, and I would also ask, is that hard when you're going through such a long baseball season and you're so focused on pitching and getting right and getting ready for the next game, trying to stay grounded in your faith? Have you seen that as, as a tension, as a struggle a little bit for you? Uh, initially, initially it was always that thing because uh, you never want to appear weak. You never want to appear like you're struggling with anything because it's just, uh, for me, that's just what I've always grown up with. Like, okay, was, anytime you show anything, it's weakness, uh, and people will jump all over it. Like, because I've grown up with sports and everything like that, it was just take, you just need to calm down and, and do all that. But once you actually break through, like kind of the, uh, kind of shatter the glass a little bit per se it's it opens it up and now it's like if i'm ever going through anything there's guys i can talk to on the team like blake trinan is one of those guys that i can bounce a lot of things off and mm. he uh he's a good guy to for me to do that too because he like he, he does the same thing to me so we're able to talk not only about pitching but about faith-based things and about kids and animals and everything like that like he's one of those people that even if he doesn't know too much about the subject he's going to go out there and learn the subject because that's just the kind of guy he is you mentioned growing up in Australia. I'm curious about what your first love was as a kid. What was that like? Was was baseball always that sport that you played? Or I guess your dad being an Australian Football League player, I'm guessing football was a part of your life too as a kid growing up. Was baseball that first love though? Uh, football was definitely the first love. Like no, no question of, no question about it. Like uh, baseball was legitimately a side gig for me growing up. It just wasn't anything I was focused on. I did it because I enjoyed it, but it wasn't something that I was going to go out there and make sure that, like, okay, I need to take it easy this week playing football so that I don't, I, I'm not too bad doing baseball. It was always the other way around. Like, okay, like, football is my, my priority. Baseball is just an off-season thing to kind of keep me in shape. When you, when you chose baseball, what was that like? What was your dad's reaction? My dad, my both my parents, they were very much like, no, look, you do whatever you choose to do. We're going to support you no matter what. Um, like we don't mind. Obviously, my mom was a my mom was a little disappointed just because of not not 
because of baseball over football and like that, it was because baseball was in America and football was in Australia. So that was yeah. the only that was the only gripe we had. But I mean, yeah, I decided to do it around the age of seventeen. Uh, it was I actually I had to make a decision around the age of sixteen because I was selected for both the under sixteen baseball and uh, football state teams. So state teams over there is a is a relative big deal. It's like uh, your representative teams and stuff like that. So my uh, one of my best friends, her, his dad was actually the coach of the under sixteen state team. So it was it was one of those decisions where like if I did it. He's like, you, you have to pull out of the team because you can't do both because these two things are coinciding and they're on the same time. Uh, but, like, just let you know, if you decide to do it now and then all of a sudden three weeks before the tournament, the football tournament is on, like, as long as you, like, if we'll have you can come down and continue practicing and stuff like that, but it's just you, um, you still have a chance if you do that. But if you're making a decision now, we need to move on and we need to prepare ourselves as well. Liam Hendricks is our guest here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. I want to ask you about making that adjustment to professional baseball, being a kid from Australia, coming over to the States. So you have that going against you in terms of adjusting to a new, you know, a whole new culture and country in the United States, but also adjusting to professional baseball and being away from home and that grind of playing in cities like Beloit, Wisconsin and Rochester, New York, Fort Myers, Florida, Omaha, Nebraska, just that grind of the minor leagues. That, what was that like, I guess, for you as you were adjusting both as a Australian coming to the States, but as a new guy trying to adjust to professional baseball? Uh, so for, I got lucky in the fact of like, uh, not only were the twins want the highest offer I got, but they were also very big into the Australian market. So there was 10 other Australians when I got to like to, to Fort Myers for the GCL extended season. So I was lucky enough that I was around other guys that I didn't have to start from scratch with a whole bunch of guys I'd never met before. So that was pretty lucky in, in my eyes. And then uh, I didn't, like, don't get me wrong, it was an absolute grind. There were days where I hated, like, I hated it. Uh, there were days where I, I never considered quitting or anything like that because that just wasn't in my mentality. But there were days where it was just, it was tough. Like, you were just grinding through things. But I was lucky enough in the fact that I did well. Like, I didn't really struggle. And even when I did struggle, to my standards, it wasn't struggling. Like, I think my highest ERA in the minor leagues early on was, like, a, a 4.5. And that was, I mean, that that was the toughest year for me. Because that was one in Beloit, Wisconsin. And two, I was sleeping at the foot of a guy's bed because I got called up to low A with like two months left beyond the season. And I just wasn't going to be able to find an apartment or uh, there was no point in renting a mattress because one, I could barely afford it. And two, it was just, it, it is what it is. So I slept at the foot of a guy's bed, no issues, no qualms or anything like that. But then it was just, I mean, Beloit, Wisconsin, where there's just nothing to do. Yeah. And I wonder too, Liam, now here you are 2019 you're just coming off of a really great spring and getting ready for the 2019 season as we're here in early april and the season has kicked off what is some advice and maybe some encouragement that you gave some of the younger guys before you broke spring training uh that we're going back to that minor league grind and what that's like to kind of push through in that very difficult time and season of a lot of these young guys life trying to break through and make it to the major leagues what's some encouragement and advice you were you were giving some of these young guys it's always tough because not only one i want to be able to give advice because i've been around long enough I've, this is my i think 12th season at uh, professional baseball but it's tough because a lot of these guys have been around almost as long as i have if not longer and you know, I don't want to feel like I'm ever talking down to people. Like, I want to be able to give support but not seem like I'm coming across as obnoxious and arrogant and above everybody else, which is it's a really fine line. So a lot of the guys that we that are here now in the Bay Series for Oakland, uh, all the guys who have been around for a while, they've all been in the big leagues. So they know what they need to do. And so right now it's just like, uh, go out there and treat everybody equally whether you're a first day rookie whether you've got 15 years in the big league you treat everyone with the same respect and reverence and and you just i hope to see a lot of these guys because there's some guys that are that should be up on the team and like unfortunately there's only so many roster spots if there was in a perfect world you'd have 40 man rosters the entire year because you've got those guys who i feel deserve to be on the team but there's just zero spots for them because of everybody else 
And Liam, as you're now in your ninth season of Major League Baseball, I'm wondering if you could take us back to September of 2011 in that first game in your debut. We love to ask that question to so many athletes here. What was that first game like for you, that memory of making that debut with the Minnesota Twins? What stands out? What comes to mind when I bring up that first game you ever pitched in? Yeah, so I still remember it because I had to take my bags off the bus. So we were um, we had two games left to the end of the season in Rochester, and I was we're leaving Rochester to go on an eight-hour bus trip to Pawtucket. So I'd already pitched. I was not pitching in the last couple games. So I'm sitting there like, okay. They call me in the office. They call, they like, hey, get your bags off the bus. I'm like, oh, God, perfect. I get to go home. I don't have to go for the last two games because I'm not going to play. So that was I was excited because I was like, my wife had left my – Girlfriend of the yeah, girlfriend of the time and now wife. She had left that morning to fly back to Fort Myers where we were living. And uh, yeah, they called me in the office and like, hey, uh, yeah, so you don't have to go to Port Tuck. I'm like, perfect. Um, can I just get like a flight out tomorrow? They're like, uh, yeah, we've already booked you a flight out tomorrow. I'm like, oh, perfect. <laughs> it's like you get on to Minnesota. I'm like, but why? I live in Fort Myers. I mean, I was 22, not expected. Like, it had to be a perfect storm for me to be able to get up. And so it was just like, I was just sitting there like confused. Like, okay, what are we doing? Like, why, what's going on? And they're like, no, 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 you're starting on Monday. Uh, okay. Oh, I was like, oh, wow. Like, okay, it's just unexpected. I really wasn't anticipating this. So my wife, I called my wife. She turns out and then she's like, okay, I need to get a flight to Minnesota. Like, I wish I had known this this morning because I wouldn't have flown out. I would have flown with you. But, um, yeah, we ended up, she ended up, like, luckily they got the days mixed up because he told me, Monday. I don't think I started till the Tuesday, which was lucky because her flight got delayed and canceled in Charlotte. Mm. So it was a start of them, but my first start was against the Chicago White Sox. And like I'm warming up in the bullpen and they announced it over the big, like the, uh, over the PA system as my debut. And Jake Peavy's warming up next to me. And obviously, any pitcher who like will know Jake Peavy. The guy's got an NL Cy Young. He's a fantastic pitcher, but he stopped his warm ups to like, look over the uh, the railing and was like, hey, man, good luck, congratulations, go get him. I just thought that was a really cool experience. I mean, you, you don't have to do that as a visiting pitcher. You don't have to, like, be nice to the the, the enemy. But it was a really cool experience. And then uh, so I get up, and luckily I was thrown to a catcher, Rene Rivera. So um, he had caught me in AAA a couple of times, so I was pretty comfortable throwing to him as well, which was nice. And, uh, yeah, first batter I face is Juan Pierre little speedy guy and I think the first pitch I threw I think it was a ball and then I think after that he hit a like a sinking line drive to left field and luckily our defensive positioning was right on and it went straight to him but I mean you ask me anything about that game and I'm going to be able to recall almost everything from that game like it was a uh, it was a pretty surreal moment like my first strikeout was AJ Pazinski my first walk was Adam Dunn my first home run was um, uh, Alex Rios the first hit I gave up was a broken bat single to Alejandro De Aza. Like, there's a lot of things I can recall about that game. It's fascinating to me how baseball players can recall so many vivid details in regards to the games that they play. Let me ask you about this, Liam, as we wind down here on the podcast, and thanks so much for your time. I know you're involved in a lot of charitable uh, areas. You're passionate about giving back. Uh, so many different endeavors that you've been a part of. Can you tell us about some of those and why giving back is so important to you? So we've, I, I've always thought about like what I can do off the field. I've always strived myself on on knowing the guys who do stuff off the field. Like obviously Anthony Rizzo is a good one. Curtis Granison is maybe one of the best ever giving back and going into the community and doing anything he can. And just being a part of that, like, just I want to be known for, I don't want to be known for not only what I did on the field, I really want to be known for what I did on the field and the impact I was able to make in people's lives and the community I was in. So the last uh, last few years, we've uh, we've worked with a bunch of different animal charities, which we're doing again. We work with uh, Players for Pits out of Chicago, Mission Canine out of Houston, which uh, rehomes, rehabilitates, and retrains uh, ex-military and police canines. We donate to a bunch of different animal charities throughout the season. Like, our, like my wife is is constantly on that. Like, okay, this dog is we're, we're pulling her out of the kill shelter and needs some medication. Like, can we get some donations? And we're usually one of the first people to donate on all of those things. So it's 
those things that we're really passionate about animals and, and it shows with everything we do. But this year we're moving into a direction with, uh, it's called No Kid Hungry. They do a program called Blessings in a Backpack. And what it is, is it's the kids who come to school and sometimes there's kids in school that the only times they get to eat is at school. So they'll get their, their lunches through school and they'll get their breakfast through school. But then they go home and they may not be able to have like a full-fledged dinner or a nutritional meal or anything like that. So Blessings in the Backpack gives these kids meals for the weekend. So they, they'll take a backpack, they'll pick it up on Friday, and they'll have their snacks, dinners, lunches, breakfasts, all in this bag ready to go for the weekend so that, one, they don't have to worry about, like, anything to do with being malnourished, like, any malnutrition, like that. Their parents get to be able to relax and be like, okay, the kids are taken care of. We can figure out ourselves, and then we can make sure we prepare this next week or these next few weeks to be able to make sure that we can go out there and do what we need to do to be successful and make sure our kids grow up healthy. That's really good. And Liam, I wonder, how, is, how does your faith play a role in the reasoning behind you giving back? I have to imagine that faith plays a huge role in all aspects of your life, but especially in wanting to serve and give back to others. I mean, you look at all the uh, references through the Bible, it's always about Jesus giving back. It's always about giving what you can, doing what you can. And that's just, we've kind of taken that in stride. Like, okay, we have a platform that there's not too many people have this have a similar platform to athletes or celebrities or anything like that. And so for me, it was just one of those things, like, I'm going to use my platform. I'm going to make sure that people know that there are things out there that they can do to help. And anytime you look at doing a charity work, especially like when I was, in, when I was younger or even back home, it's, it's a very daunting process to go out there and look at and see what is going on and where you can, like, what you can do to help. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's tough. So for me, it was just one of those things like, okay, we're going to go through this. I've made a little bit of money. I, we can look into starting our, like, doing our own things and do all this. But let's get, let's get in touch with some established companies, some, some groups that are doing some really, really good work on the ground. And let's move on from there and we can see what happens. So it's just making sure that, um, that we can continually do something. Like Blessings in the Backpack is something that we can add into the community here in Oakland. And then if I get traded or move on to another team or something like that, someone else can step into my shoes and take over that kind of that, that role. I can hand the baton off and we can move from there. And then it's also something that I can get and pick up and take with me to another, another team as well. So it's, it's one of those things that I, that's what I want to be able to do. I don't want to be specific to an, like an area, which like as soon as I leave, it could fall through. Yeah, I want to be able to take something that I can do, that I can take with me, and that somebody else, it's easy enough to step into somebody's shoes, and they can control it from there as well. Yeah, and ultimately, it makes an eternal impact in a lot of the great work that you're doing, Liam. And listen, I really appreciate you being here on the podcast. Final question, and we ask this to all of our guests here on the podcast. What are you learning from God right now in this season of life, getting ready for the 2019 MLB season? You're with the Oakland A's right now. What are you learning from God? What's he been teaching you in this season of life? Uh, it's a lot of patience. Like last year, I had a very interesting year. If you followed it at all, I was not only was I, um, not only was I, I was in a, I was hurt. I was struggling physically, but I, ended up taking it out mentally on not only myself, my wife, but also the team. Like I ended up having a pretty bad attitude towards the end of the last year when I was hurt. Uh, and then I got humbled by being designated for assignment, spending some time in AAA, uh, going back to kind of the grassroots of things and be like, look, I play this game because I love the game, not because of what I feel like it should bring me. And it kind of humbled me a lot in that, in that respect. And I came back up in September, was able to do well. And then it was just being a, a my focus has really been on making sure I can just stay in that lane and not expect things. Like I went, there's certain times, especially during the season where I'm expecting good things to happen. And when something bad happens on the field, like I, it kind of snowballs and it isn't a good feeling. So it's one of those things where it's just like patience and just being ready for anything is just something huge. So we going through the Bible and stuff like that with the, with baseball chapel. And, and that has been nice. Obviously we, it's been a little bit discombobulated with the fact of Japan and everything like that, but it's just always good. Like you can find a lesson in anything and you know how it goes. You read the Bible all of a sudden you read the Bible. You can read the same passage 365 days a year 
and you're going to get 365 different meanings from it. And so that's something that's important to me, just going through it, making sure that you actually glean it and absorb it rather than just read it. Yeah. He is Liam Hendricks. This has been great, Liam, talking to you. Oakland A's pitcher will be watching, wishing you a a successful 2019 season wherever you are, hopefully with Oakland and doing some great things there. Had a good season last year, the team did. And uh, wish you nothing but the best, my friend. Say hi to your wife, and uh, we'll get you back on again soon. All right. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me. And many thanks to Liam Hendricks from the Oakland A's for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. Liam just joined Instagram a couple months ago. He's at Hendricks underscore 31, H-E-N-D-R-I-K-S underscore 31 on Instagram. Give him a follow there. Let him know that you heard this story, uh, his story, I should say, on the Sports Spectrum podcast and and you know, tag him on any post that you might share of this podcast on Instagram. I'm sure he'd love to to hear from you and really appreciate him and looking forward to 2019, seeing what the Lord has planned for his season in Oakland and uh, wish him and his wife, Christy, nothing but the best. Many thanks to Liam. Many thanks to Compassion International for sponsoring this podcast, a great partner with us here at Sports Spectrum for $38 a month. You can release a child from poverty through the great work being done at Compassion International. The website, Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Release a child from poverty and sponsor them today. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Find us on social media at Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Our handle is at Sports underscore Spectrum. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, And find us, of course, on our website, sportsspectrum.com. A great website with lots of wonderful content produced daily. Articles, devotionals, videos, first-person stories from athletes themselves on the intersection of sports and faith. Check it out, sportsspectrum.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time with a brand new episode of the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Have a great rest of your day.